Welcome again, and at this time, please join me in also welcoming our lovely moderator, Janelle Riley. Oh, that's a long walk down here. Okay, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, as the nice woman told you, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm the Associate Features Editor at Variety. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to the SAG, it's called SAG Foundation Event with Guest Actors, but this is really what Janelle watches. Um, could be the subtitle of this show. Uh, so at this time, please join me in welcoming some very familiar faces I'm sure you'll recognize. Uh, let's start with an actress recently seen in The Devil's Do. She plays the uh, very sexy, very dangerous undercover spy Lucia on The Americans. Please welcome Amy Carrero. <laughs> Uh, for you theater people, you might recognize this actress from musicals like Legally Blonde and Kinky Boots. She plays the prostitute Betty on Masters of Sex. This is a guest role that was recently promoted to a series regular for season two. Please welcome Annalee Ashford. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, we have a Tony-nominated actor. He's appeared in countless films, TV, and stage roles. Just to, as an example of his range, two of my favorite movies I don't think could be more different, uh, The Brother from Another Planet and Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Actually, they're both sci-fi. I guess maybe they're not that different. Um, he is currently appearing on Scandal, which is a show full of very bad people, and he might just be the worst <laughs> as uh, Rowan Pope. Please welcome Joe Morton. I'm so thrilled we have an actress here. You might recognize her as Zach Galifianakis' wife in the campaign. Her fantastic turn on Louis this season garnered her raves from everything from Entertainment Weekly to the New York Times. Please welcome Sarah Baker. We have a very accomplished stage and screen actor. He has the unique distinction of playing two of the most vile characters on TV last year, uh, with turns both on Law and Order, SVU, and of course, as George Mendez, AKA Porn Stash, on Orange is the New Black. Please welcome Pablo Schreiber. I know, I can hear you all. You're all saying he's so tall and handsome. <laughs> like, and not creepy at all. <laughs> uh, finally, an actress who won an Emmy Award just last year for her turn as attorney Elizabeth Taschione on The Good Wife. Um, if there is a hit drama show on the air, odds are she's been on it in the last year with recent memorable arcs on the following, True Blood and Person of Interest. Please welcome Carrie Preston. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and uh, congratulations on, on really a, a great year. <laughs> um, because this is a SAG audience, I, I always like to start by asking, um, how did you get your SAG card? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I got my SAG card in 2009 doing a little movie called Adam and the Chipmunks, The Squeakle. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was my first audition out here, actually, and I been auditioning in Miami for a while, and I don't look like Sofia Vergara, so that's what people go to Miami to do, is cast Sofia Vergara. And I'm not her, so I had no luck in Miami. And then I came out here, and that was my first audition and my first job. And who did you play? Because I know I've seen this movie. I, I played a person. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Yay! I had a, a crush on Theodore, and I had like maybe three lines, and... Um, Betty Thomas, who directed it, was really wonderful. And I remember she couldn't remember anybody's name, but she remembered mine. And she called everybody puppy. And so she'd go around the room like after a take and say, you were normal, you were human, you were you were fine. Puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, do it again. That was awful. So, yeah. That's it. Oh, that was magic. <laughs> also, maybe think of Alvin, Simon, Seattle. <laughs> well, okay, anyway, so... Um, um, <laughs> Um, I, I got my SAG card um, playing 
a label queen, that was my name, um, in Sex and the City, the first movie. And um, we had to shoot it, like, in the middle of the night because at a Starbucks in Union Square because, like, the paparazzi was crazy because it was Sex and the City, the movie. <laughs> and I was broke and had to put my SAG card on a credit card, and it took me a long time to pay it off. <laughs> <laughs> I got it! Um, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> it was a film called Between the Lines. It was directed by the same woman who did Hester Street. Um, it was a kind of about a newspaper very much like The Village Voice in New York City. Um, it starred everybody from Stephen Collins and... Oh, see, I knew I shouldn't have started that. But a list of actors <laughs> that you've all seen um, who have all sort of done well in, in the meantime. And that's how it started. Hi. Um, I got my actual SAG card um, from an episode of The Office I did, but I had been eligible for a little while, and I had the nightmare thing of um, I had auditioned, like, the previous week, and then I thought I didn't get it, and then, the, like, it, because it was in its, like, fifth season or something, so they were, you know, they weren't super uh, worried about getting their actors there on time or anything, so they called at, like... Seven o'clock the night before, and like, oh yeah, she got it, but a different part. But and she starts tomorrow. <laughs> and they assumed, I guess, that I was already in SAG, but I had done all this after work because I'd done a lot of cable stuff, and that at the time was a lot of after stuff. So um, I had to have like a panic attack the next day when the like second AD was like. Oh, yeah, well, we might have to recast you if it doesn't come through in time. And I was like, but I've auditioned so many times, and I finally got on. But it, um, And then the hair and makeup people, because they always help you, they were like, it's going to be fine. It's going to work out. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and it did. And it worked out. Yeah. I got my card. Uh, I got my SAG card from a, uh, a modern classic that I, I know as a Bubble Boy, and you probably know it as that too, starring Jake Gyllenhaal. I played um, Todd, the leader of the bright and shiny people, um, which was a cult that was um, <laughs> led by Fabio. As, as Fabio, or was it Fabio playing a character, or was he himself? I mean, Fabio doesn't really play characters. <laughs> Fabio, Fabio does what Fabio does. He shows up and says his lines, you know. So that's how I got my set card. I would love to learn from Fabio on a set. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. It was actually shortly after his uh, terrible roller coaster accident. It was, oh, it was just a, a, a mere months after he had been hit in the face with a bird. So he was, he was, this is not funny, guys. This is real life stuff. This is drama, not comedy, okay? Did the bird get in his hair? <laughs> I got my SAG card um, doing a pilot, actually, for CBS called Cuddy Whitman. I was playing Deputy Sheriff Molly Ann Sykes. And uh, it was starring James Remar, and um, it didn't get picked up. But it was it was really a great fun experience because I I'd, I'd only done theater up until then, and and um, yeah, it was the first time I ever shot a gun, and it was fun. Yeah. Was it a, a, a recurring role? It was supposed to be. A it was. Role on the show? It, it was like the lead guest for the pilot. Um, so I don't know if they would you know, we're going to keep me on after that. But it was it was a fairly big role for, you know, my first job in. And so I was really nervous because I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, other than having done theater. So, um, but sadly, it didn't get picked up. Uh, don't they always tell guest actors, like, hey, we're thinking of having you back? Uh, how often no. do they meet? Potentially <laughs> recurring. Potentially <laughs> recurring. That's, yeah, that's what it's like. How often does that actually pan out? Oh, yeah. Well, it did for me, which is, like, crazy. But, you know, it happens so often that you don't, so you never expect it. I mean, I still cannot believe that I'm actually, like, I'm driving around this car that's really funny right now. It's a 1988 Volvo, and I roll down the windows because there's no air conditioner, and I'm rocking it in Los Angeles in a Volvo, and I can't believe it. I'm so grateful. This is just like, uh, I, we shot the pilot like two and a half years ago, 
I read the script. There were two scenes, and I actually went in for a completely different role. And I was I was getting on the train. They called and said, "Are you on the train yet?" And I said, "I'm talking to you, so I'm not on the train yet." And they said, "Come back and, and audition for the the hooker." So I went back up, and I got it in a cold read. And they just kept writing me back in. And then I wasn't even on the rest of the season, and I thought that there was no way that I could ever come back. But if you don't die. <laughs> There's always a way. Yeah. So I can't believe it. I would point out on Joe's show, even if you do die, there's yeah. still a way. There's always a way. I mean, yes. yes. I mean, for me, it was different. They, they actually, when they offered the role, the big secret was that I was going to have the last, or Carrie and I would have the last two lines of the script at, at the end of season two, which was, hello, dad. Right. Um, so I knew that I was going to be Carrie's father. I didn't know how far after that it was going to go. And then season three, they just kept writing. And I'm, as she said, still alive. <laughs> I just heard someone gasp when you said you're Carrie's dad. Did we just spoil something for someone? <laughs> you were season behind. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I mean... How, did they tell you how much you would be doing on the third season? Was it a surprise to you? Complete surprise. I had no idea. I mean, the way Shonda works is she doesn't tell anybody anything. I mean, the fact that I knew that I was going to be Carrie's dad in the show was the secret. Carrie didn't even know. Nobody, no one in the cast knew. I was the only one who knew that that was going to happen. And then once season three began, um, I was pleasantly surprised with the monologue and thought, oh, this is great. And then surprised again and again and again with all those monologues, which was terrific. But she doesn't ever tell us from episode to episode what's going to happen. So we don't know until we sit down at a table read what's going to happen. So everyone is on pins and needles. Like Josh Molina always goes through the, back, you know, the last page of the script <laughs> to see if he's going to die. As a matter of fact, at the end of season two, when they put the scripts on the table, he went to the end of the script and it looked like he was dead. <gasps> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I go through the script immediately to make sure I don't have to have sex and that I didn't die. <laughs> Which one scares you more? Well, I want to have a job, so <laughs> I don't want to die. Uh, and for the rest of you, can you, can you tell us about uh, booking these roles, if it was an offer or an audition situation? I've never been offered anything in my life. Um, <laughs> have a water. Never. Um, maybe soon, no. Uh, well, this was actually... Um, I the Americans is shot in New York, and I uh, was at an audition for something else. And it was like, why would there be an audition at 8 p.m.? I don't know, but it was late. And I was like in the valley, and I get a text or an email, like breakdown, and it's 11 pages, and I had to translate the scenes to Spanish. Oh. And it was like, and they were like, and it has to be in at 6 a.m. LA time, you know, for New York. And I was like, this, I'm not gonna, this will never happen. Who can I get to put me on tape? And so my friend, uh, who just happens to be a Tony Award nominee and Yale graduate, I begged, I was like, please help me put this on tape. So by the time we were done, it was like two in the morning. And I thought, well, I'm never gonna get this. And I was going to Palm Springs with some friends the next day. And so I drove to Palm Springs. And as soon as I got there, they're like, hey, can you come back to do a Skype callback? And I'm like, is that even a thing? And it is. So I drove back, and it was like new, and it was new sides too. They'd written like a oh. new, and it was a sex scene. And you guys will know, I'm sure you've been out on a lot of auditions where it's a sex scene for an audition. That's awful. There's nobody there. It's like a person who, it's like reading the phone book to you, and you're like, yes, I love this. It's so hot. It's just weird. And so. Um, I walked in. I walked into the room, and it was at Universal, and there were all these Oscars. And I'm like, "Where am I?" And it said, "No, what did it say? Amblin." I had no idea what that was. And I started reading the Oscars, <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, this is gonna be real fun." And uh, the woman who was running the audition, she said, "And you're in luck because the co-chairman of Amblin Television is gonna sit in on your callback." And I'm just thinking. How am I going to remember the line, I want to rub my tetas all over the congressman's desk? That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> and so the guy comes in and totally stone-faced, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to do this. And I did it, and he had no reaction. I thought, well, I'll never work again. I want to die. <laughs> but I went home, and I got the job. And I got a call, and I got the job. So there it is. <laughs> if, 
they made you come into the office to do a Skype call? Because isn't the whole point of Skype? You can do it from anywhere? You'd think so. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, they, they wanted, because I guess the, the co-chairman of Amblin Television wanted to be there, I don't know, and, and, um, and wanted to intimidate me with his Oscars. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, I mean, and I also, but they were very nice. They wanted me to get the job. Like I had a, a great conversation with the creators of the show um, and they gave me like a whole rundown. They told me what was going to happen to the character once, you know, what happened. So uh, they were really wonderful. They wanted me, they were helping me as much as they could. Yeah. Uh, and Sarah, from what I understand, Sarah, didn't you have to do your monologue in the audition? It's like nine pages. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I, yeah, I just got a regular old email, but it was for Louie, which I knew cast out of New York, um, and I l happened to be obsessed with that show, so I was like, oh, this is, I'll do whatever it is. Um, they said, come 15 minutes early, um, he's, you know, protective of his material, and so they wouldn't send me any sides, S and then they called back, and they were like, actually, come like a half an hour early, because it's... <laughs> It's like nine pages of sides. And I was like, ah, oh, cold read? Cool, 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 cool. So, um, so I did. I just got there early. And luckily, it was Felicia Fasano, casting director, who's amazing. And um, they were like, go sit in my office. Like, they, they hooked all of the women up that came in for it and let us take our time. And Louie wasn't there, which is good, because it was a little less intimidating. But it was just Felicia and her assistant and um, Pamela Adlon, who works on the show, who's amazing and is on the show. Um, and, yeah, and I, I had to do that last monologue. I don't remember if I had to do any other pieces of it. Um, but mostly it was just that last monologue. And Pamela was really nice. She, I mean, I think she's just a nice person, but she did make me feel like, we've already like looked at some of your material and we really want to get you this part. And um, so I, you know, it was just a taped thing that then Louis had to watch. And, and then, yeah, I got the part. And when you actually did that scene, uh, you know, when you actually shot it, I've heard that, I, I don't know how much different it was from the initial audition, but I hear it can be really hard to do a scene that you did in an audition because you don't know if you should do something different. You don't know if they want to see the exact same thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess I always figure um, whatever got you the part is what they want you to do. Um, but um, certainly, I, I also assume that they will tell you <laughs> if you're not doing what they want, what they you know they want you to do. Um, but yeah, shooting it, um, I don't think it had changed much. And a lot of people, for some reason, think it might have been improvised, but it was completely not improvised. There were other parts of the episode that were improvised, but that last long scene was um, completely 100% scripted by Louis C.K. Uh, did you improvise a scene with Ed Burns? Because he's randomly in the restaurant yeah. and you're serving him and it's never addressed. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I don't know why they didn't use that number, that tall drink of water. Um, but yeah, they, it was, there was basically a little scripted scene where I say like, holy shit, oh my God, you're Ed Burns. I love you. And he's like, hey, I love you too. And pulls me onto his lap and he's flirting with me. And it, I think it echoes back to some of the things talked about in the final monologue. Um, but then before that happens, and Louis is supposed to be watching this interaction happen. And so before that, it was just supposed to be an improvised thing where I'm just taking their drink order. And he, um, and so there was nothing there. He was like, just, you know, be, have fun with them, be loose with them. And so I was just, you know, that was the first scene I shot. And I was like, okay, well, let me just be, you know, a normal waitress. I mean, I was trying to be somewhat entertaining, but it was very intimidating because I'm an actor. I'm not a stand-up. I'm not a joke writer. I improvise, but um, to try and be funny in front of Louis C.K., as dumb as it sounds on his funny show. Obviously, he wanted me to be funny, but it felt very intimidating to put myself out there to try to be funny. So I was just kind of a normal waitress, and it was fine, whatever, did the whole scene, and, and Ed had all this you know, material, whatever, and he was great. And then they turned around just to get Louis's um, reaction. He was just, he didn't have any dialogue, he was just watching. But he said, like, oh, you know, just do something fun for me. And I thought, oh, okay, he wants you know me to have some fun with it, so he'll have a, you know, you can have a spontaneous reaction. So I started improvising all this kind of filthy stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, if you saw the, ep I won't repeat it, it's gross, but it's just, you know, just, <laughs> it, it, it was all this like kind of sexual goofy stuff, but in a totally joking way. And then after that take, he was like, God damn it. And I was like, 
don't know. I had a, like, red face. He was like, now I have to turn the camera around on you again. And I was like, what? And he was like, why didn't you do that when we were doing your scene? I was like, oh, I was just, I thought I was just being stupid. I didn't know you wanted me to be stupid. Oh, okay. And luckily, it's such a, it's like shooting an indie film, shooting that show. It's such a small crew, and they just turned the camera around. It wasn't a big deal, but after, luckily that was my first scene, so then I sort of realized, like, okay, just pretend like you're doing one for Louis every time and have fun with it. <laughs> and Pablo, I, I think that uh, in Orange is the New Black, it, it was an offer, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, actually, both of the uh, Law and or Order SVU and the um, Orange is the New Black were both offers. From um, prior relationships, which was really nice, uh, Warren Light is the showrunner on Law & Order SVU, and he had written Lights Out, which is a show that I did um, one season of for FX. And so he created that character for me, the Law, the Law & Order character. Um, Wait, is that flattering? Cause <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so I saw, him, uh, I saw him at a Knicks game. And he saw me in the aisle, and he's like, oh, man, it's been so long. I'm, I'm working on this thing. You should come do it. And I had no idea what it was. And then a month later, I got a call about it. And so I came and did it. And it was one of those things that just, they didn't, they, there was two episodes. It was the season finale and the season premiere, and that was supposed to be it. And then I guess they got really good ratings on that because of the relationship between Mariska and I and, and her being a victim now, which has never happened in that show. And so then they brought me back to do the courtroom episode, and then they brought me back to do a reappearance when I break out of jail. Like, literally, they would have continued to bring me back on that show for as long as they could have. But I, I, I said, we have to kill that guy off eventually. That was you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? I mean, you, can, you can only go to the well with that kind of thing so often, you know. I mean, it's... Um, Wait, so an actor wanted to be killed off on a oh, show? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually wouldn't have done the last. The last one I did was, was just... Um, I would have ended it with the courtroom if it was up to me. Because that was... It was like... Just it was a massive episode, and it, it was I would have left it at that, but they wanted to do it again, so we did it. And the Orange Is the New Black, I had done Weeds with uh, Genji Cohen, who is the show showrunner there. And um, my agents put me up for Jason Biggs' role, which is Larry, the the husband of Piper. And and Genji said, "Oh, that doesn't really work. I'm not. I don't see that." I was like, "Yeah, well, me neither." <laughs> and um, <laughs> and then. Uh, I had a friend who was on the writing staff who, who was an uh, actor with me at Carnegie Mellon University. And she then, somewhere in the 10 years since we'd been out of school, had, had uh, switched over to writing. And she was on the writing staff, and she told me, hey, you should look at this character called Porn Stash. We're writing a lot of really good stuff for him as the season goes on. And so I said, okay. I, I read the pilot, and it was one scene. I was like, this, I mean, really? You're suggesting me for a one-scene role? <laughs> I mean, I know we're friends from school, but that's kind of rude. Um, <laughs> but no, it turned out that they were indeed creating a bunch of stuff, and so so uh, my inside intel paid off. I mean, did you? Was it a situation where you just asked Genji if you could play that part? Yeah. Then so my agents went back to them and said, "Well, what about porn stash?" And she was like, "Yeah, great idea. Come in and try on some mustaches." <laughs> <laughs> we did. They found one that worked, and then we put it on tape. What is the process of trying on mustaches? I mean, is it, you know, this one's too bushy, this one's too Hitler-esque? Yeah, pretty much. Too bushy was uh, was what it was. And actually, they settled on one, and they thought it was right. I wanted a handlebar thing, um, <laughs> but I guess because it was porn stash, the, the, it had to be like a 70s porn stash. So, so we did that. That was obvious. And then uh, the one that we found that worked really well um, they thought what it was just when we finally put it on camera in the first episode, it looked a little bit like a walrus. It was just like really thick and bushy. And so they were looking at that. And if you look at the, the episodes in the first episode, it's just like really big mustache and it gets thinner and smaller as the season goes <laughs> by episode three. We had found the, the perfect mustache, but the haircut for me was even more important than the mustache. I brought in a picture of uh, Dolph Lundgren in Rocky four. And I said, you give me this haircut. And so we did the high and tight, and that was that. And that's your real hair? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't fake that. I'm, I'm trying to imagine an alternate universe where you're Larry and Jason Biggs is porn stash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't, go, don't go too far with that one. And Carrie, I guess specifically, if we could talk about The Good Wife. Yes, The Good Wife was a gift. Um, it was an offer. And uh, 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 Robert and Michelle King, um, they had seen this movie I did called Duplicity. 
um, where I have, you know, like I have a, a really wonderful sort of three scene role in that movie. And, and it was, you know, had, had a, a really funny um, kind of vulnerable sort of quirky take. And they thought, oh, sh I feel like, you know, what she did there, she might be able to bring something interesting to this, this role of uh, Elsbeth Tassioni, who was called Elsbeth Mann mm -hmm. at first, and that didn't clear legal. And then it was Elsbeth Torsiglieri. While we were on set shooting, because I kept having to say, I'm Elsbeth Mann. And they would say, no, no, no. Now you're Elsbeth Torsiglieri. Okay, okay. I'm Elsbeth Spaghetti. I mean, I couldn't remember <laughs> the name. I was like, and then it, they landed on Tassioni. I was like, okay, so Italian? Okay, fine, whatever. But they had... um you know, told me, well, it's going to be a possible recurring. Yeah. And so, um, and that show, you know, is known for its its awesome guest roles, you know. So I just thought, God, this is such a brilliant role. I hope I don't mess it up. You know, I've, I hope I could just go in there and, and give them, you know, something to make, to make them want to bring me back because it's such a great part. So I did two episodes at the end of their first season, and then I didn't hear anything for a whole season and I was like oh no and I went through this whole like mourning process of like you know and then and then the anger process I don't need that I'm on true blood I don't need their stupid show you know I like so I did that whole thing you know? and but meanwhile I was heartbroken and then out of nowhere they called in in season three and said you know we've got this four episode arc and and that was when I really felt like the that we really found the rhythm of of the woman because she you know she don't she don't work like everybody else you know so um and then you know they've been bringing me back since so um you know it's been a real a real great and i won an emmy so it was like an amazing moment you know who, who knew Uh, I, I'm sure I don't need to remind you, but your husband started out by winning a guest actor. Yes, yeah, see, in my house, when in, in the, the relationship I'm in, when you do a guest spot, you win an Emmy. So I, like, I was like, oh, God, you know, because he, he did the practice, and it was the first TV show he had ever done, and he won an Emmy. Um, and so I, it was, it's very hard not to compare yourself, you know, but luckily um, we now have his and hers, so... <laughs> Where do you keep them? I'm curious. They're they're next to each other. Well, he has another one. He's yeah. He's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, we keep them side by side on a shelf. Yeah, just right next to each other. Uh, I'm curious. Um, obviously, in, in this case, all these roles worked out for you. But um, we do hear those horrible audition stories from every actor. Uh, <laughs> would you be willing to share with us your worst audition? Unless they've all been perfect. <laughs> Um, there's so many. I know there are so many. <laughs> I remember my. I think my. It was oh gosh, 20 years ago, so it's only like that. My son had just been born, and I had an audition the following morning, and I'd been in the hospital with my wife the entire night, and I was the first one up for the audition. So I came in bleary-eyed, couldn't put two words together. Um, I thought, you know, this is just stupid. Why am I here? And I got the role. <laughs> Would you be willing to say what it was? Or It was a TV movie. I don't even remember the name of it. Um, uh, it doesn't much matter. Because um, uh, I, as I said, I walked in. I had no idea what I was saying, what I was doing. All I could think of was my wife at the time. And my son had been born. I just wanted to get back to the hospital. And I walked out. And I thought, well, and then I got a call saying, well, you have to you know, get on a plane two days from now and go to the role. And... That was it, and I did it and came back and still don't remember what it was. So. <laughs> what if they were like, do exactly what you did at the audition? I would have, that would have been easy. Because <laughs> I was completely uh, unconscious for the entire thing. I have a similar one that's, uh, that's of that ilk. Which it, my, my worst audition turned into my best audition, and it was actually my first audition. I, uh, I had just graduated from Carnegie, and I'd done the, um, the actor showcase deal. And out of the actor showcase, uh, Jordan Thaler, who was the casting director of the Public Theater in New York, had called me in to audition for the uh, the non-equity ensemble of the Shakespeare Festival in uh, in Central Park. And so I came in, and in in uh, Carnegie at Acting School, we had prepared, we had learned these different monologues, and they were, you know, you 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 have a dramatic and a comedic monologue, 
and you learn them, you get them by rote. And so they wanted a monologue. So instead of doing the one that I had learned in school at the last minute, I'm like, nah, it's not really that fun for me. I want to do a new one. And so the <laughs> night before, I, I uh, memorized Mercutio, the, uh, you know, the wisp, whatever. And um, yeah, Queen Mob has been with you. And I memorized that, and I came in, and I had a very high opinion of myself. You know, I can do this. I can do this overnight and have fun. And I came in, and, and I started. It's my first audition as a professional actor. And I started, I got about a line in, and I just completely forgot. Completely went up. I was like, okay, no, you know, stop. Let's start again. I can do it. I can do it. Smile, keep smiling. Went back, started again, and same place. Went up again, second time. Jordan Thaler, to his credit, I mean, this is like one of the great sort of stories of my life, is that he, he got up, he said, hey, no problem, don't worry about it, no big deal. Would it help you if you had a copy of the complete works of Shakespeare in front of you to read from? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, that, that would help. That would help. I think I could do it then. So he left the audition room, and Heidi Griffiths, who's his partner, is sitting there has, making small talk with me while he walks two floors up to his office, gets the complete works, brings it back, gives it to me. And I read Queen Mob from Mercutio for my audition and left. And I was like, wow, OK, I just completely blew my acting career. That's that. And I got a call two days later, and I was hired for the part. To, to be a, you know, spear carrier number three uh, non-equity ensemble in uh, Shakespeare Park, so. I actually, every, like, major theater job that I've had, I thought that I sucked so bad that I literally, every single one of them, call, like, walked out, called my mom, cried hard, Especially Legally Blonde. I auditioned once for Legally Blonde, which for a musical is very, very unusual because there's so many things you have to do in a musical. Um, and I auditioned once, and I walked outside, and I literally called my mom and cried and said, I blew it. And I really, I was thought I could do it, and I blew it, and I sounded so terrible. I always think I sound terrible. Um, and then they called, like, that afternoon and said, you got it. And then... From then on in my future, I continually think that I'm terrible when I get the job. So now in, I'm in a place where if I think I sucked really bad, there's a possibility I may get the job. And if I think it went really well, then it didn't go well. So I don't know what that means for me as an actress, but uh, it just means that I'm in a, another land during auditions, like a land that nobody else should go to because it's a sad, dark place. <laughs> When I was, um, that movie, I was just talking about duplicity. Um, when I got the audition for that, it was, it, you know, a great part, three scenes. Um, and one of the scenes is basically a monologue where my character is just weeping uncontrollably, right? So um, before I even went in, I was, you know, I was preparing for it. I get a call from my agents and they, we, we have a note for you. I was like, a note? I haven't even gone in yet. And they said, well, the casting is saying that you need to actually really cry. And I was like, okay, that's what I was planning on doing, but, you know, <laughs> thanks for that note. So um, no pressure there, right? So then um, I show up, and uh, there's, you know, several women. Of, with this, we're all the same type, and we're all sitting there, like, sort of slightly terrified. Um, and then the casting assistant comes out and says, did you get the note? And I was like... <laughs> You mean the cry on cue note? Got it. Yes. Ready to go. So then I go in and I sit down and, and it's just the director and casting director and myself. And, you know, the director's as close as Pablo is to me right now. And he's, you know, looking at me and he's like, take, take as much time as you need, Carrie. I was like, oh my God. So I'm like, you know, I mean, like, what do you do? You know, you're like sitting there trying to prepare. So I do the scene, cry, great. Okay. Feeling good. And, um, and then he was like, okay, that was great. That was really good. That was really good. Um, and then he talked to me a little bit about, like, if you were to do this scene, you know, on the day, what would you need? And, and I was like, wow, what a cool question. I'm totally going to get this part. And I said, um, I guess I would need my coverage first, you know, because I just, like, I can do this, but, you know, not for 14 hours straight. And so we had this great conversation, and I left, and I was like, I just bought this movie, you know. And I get home, and my manager calls and says, um, 
I got this weird note for you. And I was like, do they want me to cry more? And he's like, yes, they want you to cry more. And they want you to come in and wear mascara that runs. And I was like, what? So <laughs> I was like, all right, OK, I can do this. I can do this. And so um, the, the, the day before the audition, um, I was actually working on another movie. And they were like, we need you to come in. They need you to come in tomorrow you know, while you're shooting this other thing. So you'll leave during lunch break. And this was like a 1930s thing. And I was like dressed in this 1930s. And, and I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm working. I'm not going to leave another job to go and put mascara on and cry for them. I'm going to, you know, I will, I will, can I just go in and just go on tape? and just show them then. And I was like the best moment of sort of taking power of, of taking control of your own power and not giving your power to these people because I was not gonna do a good job. If I'm running on the lunch break in a wig, you know, with like wrong, make, and doing this thing, it was just, it was not gonna work for anybody. So luckily they, they accommodated me and they let me go in and, and go on tape. And, you know, so I went in, it was me and the little assistant, and I put on the mask, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried, and stuff, and then I ended up getting the job. So then it was two months before I shot that scene. So you can imagine the pressure of now I have to actually, you know, after all of this, the most important thing, which is the actual shooting of it. Um, but luckily it was um, with Julia Roberts, and she was just great. You know, she, she gave, you know, just gave me a lot of attitude and made me feel very scared and you know for you know for the effect of you know making me be in the moment so I could cry but yeah that yeah. was a pretty <laughs> rough one well pretty rough except you get to have sex with Clive Owen on a copy well yeah, yeah I did get to kiss Clive <laughs> Owen yeah that was delicious so. um I think my worst audition did not turn into a job which <laughs> I know is the the pattern on this panel but um I was doing a, a play in New York a couple years ago, and uh, and this uh, somebody from MTC came to see the show at Man Manhattan Theater Club, which is a very classy place, right? And so I thought I, I was like on a kids show on Cartoon Network. Thought, oh my gosh, I'm doing this play with like two Yale grads and a Tony nominated actress, and there's me from Cartoon Network. Awesome! And um, and I got a call for this audition for Measure for Measure that they were doing, and I was like, well, I've never done Shakespeare um, professionally or even really taking a class. I majored in international relations in college, so I had no, the, you know, Shakespeare background. And I thought, well, I have like four days to know 24 pages mm -hmm. and do it in, I had no idea. I was like, I got this. Mm -hmm. And then my, fr my friend who was in the play, she's like, no, no, you don't. We here, I'll help you. <laughs> and so um, I went in and, and, and I, I went into the, to the little lobby and, and the, um, Nancy Piccioni, which is the casting director for MTC, comes out. And she goes, so um, the director's ready to see you. I was like, what? This is a director's like session? Oh, my gosh, this is so nerve-wracking. So I go in, and he wants to do the scenes in reverse order. And I'm like, well, no, because here's the thing. I know. Um, so I said that. I was like, no, I think we'll do it the other way. And he didn't love that. Um, <laughs> So I did it, and, and then he goes to me, after the first scene, he goes, I can tell you've worked very hard on this. Oh. <laughs> Which is like the worst thing you ever want to hear. And, um, and so I did not get it. Um, that's it. <laughs> I thought I did a good job, but you know. I didn't know the, it was, you know, after like trying to learn all this like stuff, and it's like a new language, and then having to do it in the pentameter, I was like, fuck the pentameter. I'm just gonna play my, Damn objectives. <laughs> it was too much. Have you done Shakespeare? Okay. I've never done Shakespeare. <laughs> so this day, I actually applied for this program they have in England to do like a 12-week Shakespeare intensive, but um, luckily I got a job and I couldn't do it. But it's not Shakespeare, but you know, it's a job. So anyway. um, I, I, I don't really have any super fun or entertaining stories. I think... For me, the worst auditions are the ones where, for whatever reason, you just sense that either they've somehow already cast the part or they're not interested in you for the part or something is happening that you are not privy to and you just, you're, you know that they're like just over it. And in those moments, 
you're just like, can we just stop? Can you just, <laughs> just save us all the humiliation, the time? Let's just let me leave. Or, or on the same note, sometimes when you know you've screwed it up. I did have one audition not that long ago, sadly, like a year ago, where it was a lot of, it was like a multi-cam, which is not super my area that I've done a lot of work in. And it was just very wordy and very precise. And sometimes if, you know, especially I do mostly comedy, if you can't find your own rhythm with something, it can be very difficult to remember and it can be very difficult to take on somebody else's rhythm that feels peculiar to you. Um, so basically I just kept going up and it was a taped audition. It was, um, the producers were in another city. So I got to this one part and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, can I just start again? She's like, yeah, yeah, of course. Got to the same part. Okay, yeah, sorry, same, same, same one. <laughs> sorry, let me just, let me start again. Four times. And, I, and the fourth time I was like, inwardly I was like, okay. Uh, just like so many tears flowing. Not, not really, but I, I wanted to cry. And I wanted to leave really badly. <laughs> and then the worst part is too, then when the next time you get an audition for that casting director, you're like, <laughs> well, hope it doesn't happen again. And I, and I do feel like the next time I went in for that casting director, I, I try not to be real charming or chatty or anything because I just feel like I'm not the type of person that can pull it off. I just had to be like, hi, nice to see you and start doing a thing. But instead I was like trying to make a joke about something that was going on and then I was like, ah, oh, cool, we're doing this again. Okay, we're going to ruin this again. Great. <laughs> yeah, I'll get her one day, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, I do want to take some audience questions. We have, um, and again, I apologize if I butcher anyone's name, um, Mary Newsom. Oh, great. Uh, well, this is a question for Pablo, but I, I actually want to open this up to um, Joe and Amy. You you also play what could be perceived as villains. Um, is it difficult to find a redeeming quality? Uh, well, this was specifically for William Lewis on SVU in order to play him so intensely. Um, yeah, it is difficult to find a redeeming quality in William Lewis. Not so much for Porn Stash, because I think there's more... There's humor involved in that one, and so it, it, it lightens it up. And, um, and he's easy to find uh, redeeming qualities in because I think his insecurities are so obvious, and, and he just wants to be loved, and, and that's, that's quite easy to find. William Lewis obviously is a sociopath um, and is probably the worst human being ever invented. <laughs> so um, redeeming qualities are not easy to come by. So uh, for me to focus on playing that role, um, it was really just about, with that character, he has to be really charming. He has to, um, he has to earn people's trust immediately and, and then do horrible things to them, obviously. So as an actor, in that situation, you kind of let, the, the, um, you kind of let his actions speak for themselves. The actions are the horror part in that. You know, what he does is what makes him so scary. And that's all kind of uh, reported by other people. Um, and so really the focus in that one is to play the charm, you know, to play what it is that breaks down people's defenses about him, why people trust him so much, mm -hmm. and then the fact that he betrays that. And when you, and you see those, those moments, I guess, when, when he turns and he betrays people's trust, but really, the, the focus for me was in, in getting the charm, um, because then it makes the, the other part all that much more scary. I'm not really sure if I answered your question, but I'm sure I answered something. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I just flew out from New York, and I, I forgot my, my driver's license in New York, and so I, I ended up flying without my ID. And I accomplished this by, when I got to the front of the line, the TSA woman, I, she looked up at me, and before I even told her I didn't have my ID, I saw the look in her eyes, and I knew that everything was going to be okay. <laughs> she, she looked at me like I was about to kidnap her and take her on a three-day raping spree. And, um, and I, just, I just said, I'm really sorry, I don't have my ID. She said, it's okay. <laughs> Best perk ever. <laughs> Joe, for your character, I mean, I don't think he sees himself as a villain. No, he does not. And, and generally speaking, I think that when you play a villain, I mean, we, we've all heard this in acting classes over and over and over again, you can't ever play 
a negative. Mm -hmm. So from my standpoint, all villains think they're doing something to make the world a better place, whatever that might be. Um, their, whatever their motives are, whatever is operating inside of them, they're making, whether it's their world or the entire world, a better place for people to live in. And so for Rowan, clearly, um, if it's to protect the Republic or protect his daughter, it's all to make all that a better place for either one of those situations and try to do it at the same time, obviously. At the same time, when you get a script, uh, spoiler alert, everyone, um, is, there, is there ever a time when you see it and you're just like, ah, oh, kill a kid? <laughs> Again, I mean, <laughs> you know, revenge is one of those terrible things. And so from his perspective, he's making his world, you did this to me, so I'm doing this to you, and we're even. And it's just as, for me, it's just as clear as that. It's, it's this makes my world a better place, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but that's, I'm sort of cleaning house here. Well, when you're on a show like The Americans, which is about Soviet spies, and they're the hero, you know, um, it's the lines are very blurry. And um, I'm from Miami originally, which is a very conservative Republican town. And you wouldn't think so from like the stories that you hear from your friends, but it is. And um, and so I grew up around a lot of Cuban people that had very, very strong feelings um, about communism or socialism or anything like that. So playing a Sandinista was, it, you know, like I just had to kind of put all that aside and and try to figure out this woman and her history. And it's funny because I'd actually met a few people from women in Nicaragua. I did I studied, like I said, international relations in college. And I went to Nicaragua years before, not knowing that I would ever even be an actress or audition for to play a Sandinista. And so I met women who would have been Lucia's age in 1982. And, um, and I, I think I understood their pain more than anything else. So forget any political stance. I think it's all about their experience and how how that can um, rock you in such a way that um, that you feel completely justified in everything that you do. So that's what, how I felt like I, I played. I approached Lucia in that way. I had a lot of sympathy for her. I think uh, we have a question from Eric for everyone. Um, are any of you still training in a class or privately with a coach? Um, and with who, whom and what benefits have you found from classes and coaching? I mean, I have multiple acting books by my bedside at all times. I actually do, which is kind of, kind of sounds dramatic. But I also find that a few of them kind of always, especially when you're working like in this medium, you know, I do a lot more theater. Am I out? Oh, I'm on. I do a lot of theater, so I don't need this mic. Um, thank you. Uh, so anyways, uh, so uh, you do the same thing eight times a week, sometimes my last job for a year. So I know the woman. I know the story. I know everybody else's lines. I know my lines. I know everything backwards and forwards. When you're working in television, uh, you know your lines for that day, and then you need to throw them away and learn the lines for the next day. So you're constantly being confronted with the structure and the problem of ter you know tackling a scene. What's my objective in this scene today? All right, what's my objective in this episode? Uh, I have just learned, I've always wanted to know what's my objective in the season, but we work in the same way. We don't know, we don't know what the next script is, so you c I can't do that. But I can look at each episode as a play and tackle it in that way. Um, so I find some of my favorite books to be very helpful. I also still coach, um, and any time I can take a class, it's hard to take a class because I believe if you're in a class, then you're with those people and you share that experience together and you need to be there every week. So occasionally that's a little bit um, challenging depending on the schedule, but um, but I still, I still find that it's extremely valuable and I hope that I never stop learning you know, you learn in the action of it, but um, I also think you learn in the quiet time of it. And I still take voice lessons all the time when I'm doing a sh I take a voice lesson like every week when I'm doing a Broadway show. Anyone else? I well, I, I taught at Fordham for one semester. And the great thing about that is sort of what you were saying a second ago, which is that when you're teaching, especially when you're teaching college students, college students are like sponges. They just... They want to know everything that you know. Um, and so what I needed to do was try to translate what's now become instinct into something that I could actually articulate in such a way that they could learn it. And what that does for the teacher 
because it brings you back to the basics. You start thinking, oh, that's right. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And it really sort of reinforced a lot of the things that, that I believed needed to happen in terms of how you, the, the name of the course was creating a character. So that's what it was all about. And it was, it was very edifying for me as well as for them. And it was an interesting semester because it taught me as much as I think I taught them. Um, I love being in a class, um, especially during the downtime, because so much of, you know, if you live in LA and you're just an auditioning actor, um, you forget you're an actor sometimes. Maybe you have another job that pays your bills and you just need to feel creative. So I think a class is the best way to do that. And I didn't go to theater school, um, so I love going to classes that focus on, you know, like maybe doing like a scene from Chekhov or, or you know, something like that because, um, a lot of the classes out here, I find, are kind of like, well, here's how to say two lines for this, uh, you know, audition, which is very helpful. You need to know how to do that. But I think once you've done a little bit of that, you kind of want to get into the meteor stuff. So, I, I, you know, I do it to kind of remind me that I'm an actor, too. I highly recommend um, Jack Plotnick. Um, he's, uh, he's an actor, but he has a, a website, Jack Plotnick. Dot com. I don't know if you guys have ever worked with him. He gives these audition workshops, and he's coached me. And he's a friend, but he's also helped me on some auditions and stuff. He, he really focuses on auditioning and, and sort of unlocking the, the, um, the vultures that, that want to peck at us and make us feel inferior and make us feel like we can't do what we're doing. And he um, is very positive, and he gives you, like, real specific things to focus on. Um, when you're auditioning uh, that help you get through that process in a way that you feel somewhat whole when you leave it, which can't, you know, doesn't happen all the time. So um, I, I, I recommend that. And also sometimes, you know, if, if, if I have an audition that I, I just don't feel like I've got a handle on, I, I will work with him or I'll work with my husband or I'll, I'll find somebody who... Um, who I can just spar with a little bit and sort of just, you know, break it down like an actual scene as if we're going to go and shoot it and not, not oh, I need to get this job. You know, you kind of release the need to get the job and just try to solve the scene. And so I don't take any, I haven't taken any classes in a while, but I kind of feel like by doing that, or it, it, is, it is similar. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I haven't been able to take the class and I would love to take a class again. But another thing I would say is when you are working, I like I try to like stay on set as much as possible and not like hold myself up in my trailer, which sometimes if you're working as a guest can be kind of intimidating because you don't know their process, you don't know a lot of the people, you don't know if it's it's cool, but I usually you can usually find somebody that seems accessible to talk to and say like, you know, is it cool if I just hang out and watch? Um, cuz I think you do learn a lot, especially if you're you're doing a sh type of show you've never done before, or, um, you know, I did an episode of The Crazy Ones, and I was like, why would I sit in my trailer when I can watch Robin yeah. Williams? You know, it's yeah. like, I'm gonna, if I can, and it's cool, and he turns out as like an amazingly kind and, you know, gentle, soft-spoken person, but like, if, if you can, um, try to watch and not, you know, either be blasé or be like intimidated to just say, oh, I'm just gonna hang out and watch how other people work. Um, I've always been told that it's it's actually harder to be a guest star than to be a regular on a show because you're basically showing up for someone else's family dinner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's the stuff, like, for me, it's like, who am I going to eat lunch with, you know? Like, <laughs> is there going to be, is there, it, it's, it's that same thing as, like, being in school where you're like, are the people gonna be nice? Like, and 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 it's a good lesson for when you're a regular on a show, like, mm -hmm. to be welcoming as much as you can. Because a lot of times it's not that people aren't nice, or it's just it is when you're used to your people and and your friends and your friends with the crew, you're friends with everybody when you're a regular on a show. So you're just not looking out for somebody. Um, so yeah, I I I don't know if when I'm a regular on a show, I try to remember like. If nothing else, at least if there's guest actors, be like, please come sit with us at lunch. And I, I think it's a lot harder to be a guest just because you don't know any of the moving parts, the people or the how they work, how they like to work. And so you kind of just have to be on your toes and not get in the way and be as, you know, ready and as 
like friendly and kind as, as you possibly can be and make things easy for everybody. Uh, Pablo kind of addressed this earlier, um, but you are all on shows that have very um, passionate followings. Um, I'm curious, uh, Carrie's on four of them, actually. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, what are you most often recognized for, and, and have there been any odd fan encounters, or are people, like Joe, um, you know, do people cross the street to get away from you, or are they pretty? <laughs> it's interesting, I mean, you know, for the longest time, I guess I got recognized for Terminator 2, right. For destroying and, the world. But, well, not for destroying, for dying, actually. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That was it. Um, and for people who might be older than that, it was Brother from Another Planet, which was it's still my favorite film. Um, but this has been very different. Scandal has been a very different experience. It's a hugely popular show. The character has become enormously popular. And what seems to happen is I walk in and nobody believes it's me for the first however long. And then eventually people start coming up and, and there's a lot of interaction um, and everyone says the same thing. I really was nervous. I thought you might be, you know, you might, kind of like what your experience was at, in the airport. They think you're going to do something to them, <laughs> you know, and they're very relieved when you don't. So it's, it's, it's been fun. Somebody came up to me and said, oh my gosh, your Russian accent was impeccable. And I'm like, well, it was Nicaraguan. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah. So once they, once they get over like, oh, she's not Selena Gomez, she must be the girl with the Russian accent from the Americans. <laughs> um, yeah, that happened. And also was referred to the poor man's Mila Kunis too, which I'll take it. Hey guys, no, 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 that's a compliment. I will take that. That's still pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'll take anything. I, f I feel your pain when somebody compliments you on your accent that is not an accent that you do on the show that you're on. <laughs> I chose a very, very specific accent uh, that hails from Gurney, Illinois, uh, which is like a hybrid of Chicago and Kenosha, Wisconsin. My husband is from Gurney. I basically just pretend to be his mother when I do my accent on our show. And when I can't figure out how to say something, I call him and I say, how would your mom say this? And then I, he says it, and I do it. Uh, but often people are like, I love your Brooklyn accent. <laughs> That's not it at all. It's so much work. Work. You, do. you just have to say thank, thank you. You just say thank you, because you don't want to make them feel bad. It's awkward. But often people have people don't know that I was on Masters at all because I looked very different to them, which I will take as a compliment because I was a dirty hooker. Um, <laughs> but for some reason, people don't don't they are very like when I go in for meetings the casting directors are like you look so much younger than you do on the show which I am gonna just take that as a compliment um, because that's the only thing to do but it, it's I think it is a compliment to to look so different and to feel so different I will take that as a compliment as an actress my first three was it three seasons or four seasons on True Blood I was wearing a wig so I've been a blonde, I was a blonde up until about four years ago. So I was wearing a long red wig, and so no one knew I was on this wildly popular show. And so I sort of walked around incognito, and I would, I would see all my castmates who were, you know, getting mobbed and stuff, and I was like, wow, that's interesting, nobody. <laughs> and then I dyed my hair, and then it was like, whoa, okay, now I know what they're, you know, dealing with. Um, but for me, it's fun because people will come up and, and say, I love you on the show, and then I'll profile them, you know, because I'll be like, okay, are you a true blood person or a good white person? And I can usually, like, tell, you know, it's because it's different, different demographics. And um, recently, a woman came up to me and said, um, oh, my God, I love that episode of Good Wife where you were talking to the anti-Semitic bear. Listen to my ringtone. And it's me on her ringtone going, I'm not a dirty Jew. I'm not a dirty Jew. I'm like, that's your ringtone? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> you also have lost fans to deal with because you gave birth to Benjamin Linus. I gave birth to my husband, <laughs> yes. My husband is Michael Emerson, who played Benjamin Linus. And when, when the, the producers were saying, well, you know, we should find a 
something for you to do on the show. And, and I jokingly said to Michael, wouldn't it be great when they do your flashback if I played your mom? That would be hilarious. Ha, ha, ha. And then like a week later, I'm giving birth to him in the jungle. And <laughs> um, so that was, but no, he, he gets all the, the, the crazy lost fans and stuff. And That's going to be me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah, he gets that. Like one time we were, um, we were in a, a department store and we were going up an escalator and this this woman was coming down and she sees him and just goes ah! I mean the entire time we were Michael's just <laughs> so yeah he, people are scared of him too <laughs> yeah I saw him on the street one time and I was like ah! <laughs> no in when people see him and he's on their same flight Oh, they just, it's bad. I actually know someone who was on a flight with him, and she debated getting off. Yeah, people will tweet, oh my God, Ben Linus is on my butt. Yeah, and so. she totally tweeted. That was, yep, yep. That was her. Uh, Sarah, for you, it, it kind of was like an overnight thing where, you know, this one episode airs, and, and, you know, the next week, it just seems like it was crazy. You were being interviewed by the New York Times, and... Uh, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was very crazy. I mean, for me, even still, I get more like, you look so familiar. Do you know my daughter? And then I'm like, I don't think so. And it's always that thing of, do you let them off the hook and say I'm an actor? or Which feels gross. But, um, but then sometimes they're really pursuing how they might know you, and you're like, no, it's not that. We've never met, you know? Um, I've also had famous people say, introduce themselves to me, or like say hello and say like, well, we've met before. And I'm like, no, I would remember meeting you. <laughs> You're extremely famous. You just don't realize that I am also an actor and you've maybe seen me in something. I think that's what happens a lot too. People, I can be in a scenario where like, it's an all actors and people will be like, you look really familiar. I'm like, I'm an actor too. Yeah, you might have seen me in something. But but yeah, no, I don't usually. I mean, yeah, for Louis, a little bit. But it's also in LA and New York. It feels like Louis this you know really popular show. But I mean, a lot of people don't watch Louis. None of our parents probably watch <laughs> Louis. You know, so they're you know it's that all that sort of um, reaction afterwards was crazy. But in terms of on the street, I've had maybe three people come up to me and they've all been like, oh, you were so wonderful on Louie. And like really intense and sweet and nice about it because, you know, if, if she's like a very, whatever, it's the kind of part that you, you root for the girl. It's, you know, so I don't get like, people aren't scared of me by a long shot. Did they ever, for my, this is for my own use here, um, did they talk about bringing her back? Can you reveal if she will be back? No, they did not. <laughs> not to me, no. I mean, I think, I don't know what, I don't know what Louis thought, you know, the reaction to the episode was going to be. Um, he did go on a, a show, because they aired two episodes of that show every Monday. And um, on the the episode that aired after mine, um, that same night, is was the start of the elevator thing. If you watch the show with Amia, who he did end up having a relationship with over the course of a few episodes. So he went on some shows and said, like, oh, yeah, the episode that airs tonight starts, like, a five-part series so then I had a lot of people that were like, but they're, you guys, no, it's okay because they're going to be together. She's going to be on more episodes. And I had to be like, oh, no, that's not me. That's, <laughs> that's somebody, that's the next lady he meets. So, yeah. What about, um, I mean, career-wise, did things change for you? Did you start getting, you know, um, calls or into rooms you couldn't get into before? I, I don't, I mean, my experience is that it's not that immediate. I mean, I think unless you're in something like that and somebody happens to be looking for somebody just like you and calls you in the next day. And that does happen sometimes where it's just perfect timing for something. Um, but I'm, I mean, you know, no, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know, it will. I mean, I, I think, you know, this is so gross. Good things will happen. Don't worry about we guys. <laughs> That'll be fine. No, but it's, I don't think it's that immediate, you know, it's like, it's really just been a couple of weeks that it's, that is since it aired. So I think, oh, I, do I sound sad now? <laughs> like, they're going to call. Yeah. Probably got tons of texts right now. Steven Spielberg. 
uh, we have a lot of questions actually about getting agents. Um, Eileen wants to know, um, how did you get your first agent? Do you have the same agent now? I, I do. Um, I think I always say, um, if, uh, whatever your path is, then you think that's the path everybody should take because it worked for you. For me, I, um, was like sneaky and like submitting myself for stuff because I didn't have an agent. And, um, and then I actually got called in. It was one of those, like, they were recasting something on a pilot, so they went through the stack of random people headshots. And, um, and I, you know, I had, like, I'd been taking Groundlings classes and stuff, so, um, and I had worked a little bit. And they called me in, um, Colin Daniel and Brett Greenstein, and then it just happened to be that I could actually, you know, I could do the part, and but they didn't, I mean, nobody knew me. I didn't have an agent. So it ended up being this really fast thing where they were like, can you come back tomorrow, lead, read with the lead actor, it was for a pilot. And then it just kind of, and then by the end of the week, they were like, you're gonna test for this. You don't have an agent, right? And I said, no, they're like, well, this is a really good way for you to get one. Yeah. Um, and they were really nice and they, he was like, if you have somebody, fine, but if, if not, I can call some people for you. So they like called some agents for me. You're like, we've got this girl testing for this role. She doesn't have an agent. I met with like five people. You go from like persona non grata one week to the next week meeting with five people. And it does, it can happen. It happened to me. So it, it happens. Um, but you're also like, you wouldn't have met me last yeah. week. <laughs> but, but okay, okay. But thanks for meeting with you this week. And then, yeah, and I met my um, agent, Joel King, through that and was like, okay, I think this is a guy for me. Now I've stayed with him. And I have managers now too, but. Um, yeah, I've stayed with the same agent. Um, I left school after three years. And I left school because of what may be obvious to some people and not to other people. I was sort of the only black guy in the drama department, so I couldn't get a part for any number of different reasons. And I finally said, screw this. If I have to get this kind of punishment, I'd rather get paid for it. Um, so the, the last time that happened, the, the teacher who was directing it was a, a guy named Joe Leon, who was an actor, a professional actor, who was sort of coming in to teach us what it would really be like in the real world. And he was going to do the Brendan Behan's The Hostage. And I thought, ah, see, now I can do The Hostage. He's not making love to anybody and doesn't belong. He's not Irish. He's English. And he's by himself, blah, blah, blah. No, no. He said, you can't do this part either because no pun, pun intended, but it will color the play. So I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm leaving school. So he actually called an agent because he was really upset about it. And he called an agent and he said, I want you to go in and just tell this guy that you know, call him up and tell him that you're my friend. So I got on the phone, called this guy on the phone. I said, my name is Joe Morton. Joe Leon told me to call you. And he said, fine, come in on a Wednesday, whatever it was. So it was CMA, and I went to CMA, Madison Avenue, and I walked up to the receptionist's desk, and I said, my name is Joe Morton. I'm here to see so-and-so. And she said, are you sure you're in the right place? I said, well, yeah. I looked at my book. Yeah, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. And she said, and who did you talk to? And I told her the guy's name, and she said, well, he, he doesn't work here anymore. I said, but I just talked to him on Monday. She said, well, he hasn't worked here for months. I said, well, I talked to somebody. I made an appointment with somebody. So she went back to the office, to this guy's office, came back. I went in, and I met a man named Ed Blum. It just turns out. We never exchanged names on the, on the phone. It just turns out that he also was a friend of Joe Leon's, and that's why he made the appointment. And so he became my first agent. Um, stayed with him for a long time, and uh, basically that agency sort of broke up, and um, I've been with the guy I'm with now for longer than 20 years. Um, but then, there you go. That's like 80 years in Hollywood time. <laughs> That's how old I feel sometimes, yes. Um, I actually was, uh, my freshman year of college, I went to school in New York, and I was working four days a week at the Peninsula Spa in the Peninsula Hotel, and um, a wonderful woman who was uh, running the membership department, I remember I had gotten a call back, I used to go to every EPA and course call that you possibly could go to in New York City. I mean, I went to the Shakespeare ones. I went to the musical ones. I went to the non-musical Shakespeare magic ones. I went to anything you could go to, I went to. And I'd come with my homework and sit in the cold. And uh, I finally got a call back 
um, for hairspray, and I remember it was an open call. It wasn't an you know an equity course call. Any of that. I remember Jerry Mitchell was the one who ran the the, the open call. And he's the one that gave me my first Broadway show later on, five years later. And then he ended up giving me Kinky Boots. I had this, like, magical relationship with him. But from that callback, when you have a callback or you're going to test or you have something, sometimes it opens the door. And my friend Kelly said, all right, you got a callback. So now I can get you a meeting with an agent. And then, um, you know, that was kind of my first like step in the water, having somebody to put on the top left corner of your resume, <laughs> which just makes you feel, uh, it just makes you feel like somebody's got your back when you walk in the room. Um, I got my, the way that people say never to get an agent, which is I paid to go to, I, I was in Miami and um, we're taking classes from this, this weird hybrid, like they were a production company that actually had a few shows in production in Los Angeles, which like never happens. And they also had an education portion. And so they're like, pay this money, come to LA, meet an agent. So I did it. And, um, and these, this agent happened to run a, a really, you know, great kids agency. And I, you know, I was 20, but I looked younger. And so she was like, well, I'll send you out on, on this one audition and, see what happens and I got a call back for it and so um, I was represented by her for, for a while and then I sort of like grew out of the kids agency thing so um, and then through a friend who booked me on Alvin and the Chipmunks a squeakle she made some phone calls for me after I booked my first series regular job and uh, it's really funny I got to meet you know really classy agents and at really fancy agencies and I remember I was working at a restaurant at the time on South Beverly Boulevard Drive not to be confused with Boulevard, and I, I met with this really like high end agent the day before. Then he walked into the restaurant the next day, and I served him. He never even looked up once, and I was like, "Not so much, no, thank you." Uh, so now I'm with Innovative, and they're lovely. <laughs> so that's my agent story. Um, I went to. I was one of those people who loved school, so I, I went to. I went to undergrad. I went to a couple of different undergrads, and then I went to grad school in New York. And um, and when I was in my third year of grad school, um, Eric Bogosian came to to do a workshop of um, this play that he had written called Suburbia. And so we did the first production of that play. And um, his agent came and and saw the play. And she sort of said, oh, well, uh, Carrie Preston seems interesting. And he just lied and said, oh, everybody's, everybody's trying to meet with her. He just lied. To, and so, of course, then she was like, oh, well, can I get a meeting? Can I get a meeting? And, um, and he was like, well, I'll ask her. But, you know, she's got a lot. <laughs> so I, I owe it to Eric Bogosian because then I, I met with, with her and ended up, you know, going, uh, going with her and... But I've I've had like four different agencies and um, along the way. But I'm I'm with Innovative too. I'm very I'm, yeah I'm with them now. I'm very happy with them. I've been with them for a while. But yeah, I mean you know it's like any relationship. If 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 it starts to get to a place where you're not feeling like there's a good communication or for whatever reason, then you know you you move on. Um, at least in my case, like some people, like my husband Michael, he's been with the same agent since he started working. So it's just different for each person. Yeah. I got my first agent. <laughs> I got my first agent from, uh, from a showcase from Carnegie Mellon. I uh, went to four years of school there, and then at the end they, they do a showcase in New York, and um, Innovative also uh, was there. Meredith Wechter was the person at the time who saw my showcase and asked me to come in, and I met with her. I think I had three other agencies that had asked to meet with me and I just I met with them and they they ended up being the the people that I responded to I've since left that because she left the company so she was the person who had signed me originally and once she was gone I didn't have that relationship so I was kind of in limbo there for about a year without really attaching to anybody and then um, I got nominated for Tony uh, for Awake and Sing and when that happened I kind of was had access to another pool so I took another round of meetings and uh, ended up signing with Bonnie Bernstein, who, who was at uh, Endeavor at that time. Then it got swallowed up by WME, and they fired her, so I followed her to ICM. So I've been with her ever since uh, 2005. But yeah, getting an agent is like, that's the thing, man. It's crazy. 
it's it's graduating from acting school and watching that process of who gets an agent, who gets picked up, and who doesn't is really heartbreaking. And then and then trying to figure out how to tell people to get an agent when you, you just you didn't do anything to do it except for you got you did Marlon and somebody happened to pick you up, you know. And it's a really it, it seems to be such a, a game breaker, deal deal changer, whatever. Um, and and I've always struggled with how to answer that question. How do you get an agent? Because I, I don't really. And it's it's so much different now. I mean, I feel like a really old person on this panel. <laughs> But it's so much different than it, than it was. I mean, when I started, you could actually go to an agent's office, you could walk in the door, you could show them your resume, you sit down and they would read something, and you could do that for a number of people. Then it turned into just slide your picture and resume under the door, and there was a pile somewhere that somebody would go through, and hopefully you'd get a call. Um, my son is an actor, and they, you know, now they do these showcases at the end of your school year, and the agents sort of come in and they start picking people up, and it really is that old thing of you know grabbing you know and throwing it against the wall to see what sticks, and if it doesn't stick, then they kind of don't work for you. And it's a very very different kind of pursuit than it, than it used to be. It's it's far more corporate now than it ever was before. Less about um, supporting talent and more about you know who's commercially suited for what. Um, it, it's 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 very frustrating. I actually, too, going back to the showcase, you know, I, I told you the story about working with my first agent, but I didn't actually sign with that agent. I freelanced with them, which meant occasionally they would just help me if I got a call back, you know, so that's a whole other level of being with an agent. It's not really being with an agent, but it's having somebody at least to put on your resume. Um, when we had our showcase my senior year, I didn't get one bite. So I kept going to those EPAs and I kept going to those course calls and that's what kept me going. And for me, that's always been kind of the backbone reminder that it's about the intention and it's about the work. And if you just keep thinking about that, all of those other things that are part of the business, they will fall in line. And, and your agent, at a, at a hopefully at a point in your career, isn't just a part of your business. They're one of your partners and they you know, help you forge your, your life and help you forge your creativity. But you just have to keep, you know, keep plugging away because sometimes they come around in the most unexpected ways. But we're also in a world right now where um, it's very conducive to creating your own work. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in that. I, I have a production company. I've been doing directing and producing for over 10 years now. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm not actively involved in, a, in an acting gig, I'll... I'll shoot a web series or something like that just to keep the creative juices flowing. And I feel like a lot of agents now also are trafficking in the internet world. And um, if you, you know, have a group of people that you love working with, if you, if you write, if you, you know, have, have some story that you want to tell, there's, there's ways to do it in short form and you cut it in your own computer and you can get your own work out there. You can be really proactive with your career and not wait for other people to tell you it's okay to do what you know how to do. Um, <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for being here, and especially Joe, who I understand you flew in from New York just for this. That's so generous. Yes. <laughs> um, and I want to make sure everyone gets home tonight in time to see Pablo on Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you guys for being a great audience. Yeah.